2021 midweek broadcast. We have 10 more days to Christmas. So we're on a Christmas theme and we're trying to share things that would make put Christmas in the right perspective and make it more meaningful and valuable to you. And so uh, <clears throat> tonight I'm gonna to do something a little different. I'm gonna read an article that was printed in 1998. I didn't receive it till 2015. And I've never forgot this story. It kind of etched itself in my mind. The author of this was at the time, <clears throat> the legal editor of the Chicago Tribune and journalist that did journalistic work all over the world. He was a non-believer. Now his wife got saved and it rattled his cage and he went out on a life quest to prove Christ not being true. And so you know the story of how it ended up convincing him Christ was true and he got saved. But his article that I'm going to read uh, for the most part was printed in the Chicago Tribune he was not a believer at this time. He was a skeptic and a denier, but he was fighting the truths of Christ in his own heart and his own legalistic mind, being an attorney and, and journalist and all that. The name of this article is Who Was in the Manger on that first Christmas morning? Lee Strobel was sitting quietly in his office the day before Christmas. He said as he sat at his desk with little to do, his mind wandered back to a family that he had encountered a month earlier while he was working on a series of articles about Chicago's neediest people. This family's name was Delgatos, and there was a grandmother, 60 years old, named Perfecta, and she had two granddaughters, Lydia and Jenny. Now, they had been burned out of their roach-infested tenement and they were now living in a tiny two-room apartment on the west side of Chicago. There was, he said, I was amazed when he walked in the apartment, how empty it was. There was no furniture, no rugs, nothing on the walls, only a small kitchen table with one handful of rice, that was it. They were virtually devoid of possessions. In fact, the 11 year old Lydia and 13 year old Jenny, they owned together one short sleeve dress each. Plus there was one thin gray sweater they shared between themselves. When they walked a half mile to school through the biting cold, Lydia would wear the sweater for part of the distance and then hand it to her shivering sister who would wear it the rest of the way. But despite their poverty and the painful arthritis that kept Perfecta from even being able to work. She still talked confidently about her faith in the Lord Jesus. She was convinced that Jesus had not abandoned them. I never sensed despair ever or self-pity in their home 
Instead, there was a gentle feeling of hope and peace. I wrote an article about the Delgados. They quickly moved on to more exciting assignments. But as I sat at my desk on Christmas Eve, I continued to wrestle with the irony of the situation. And I continued to wrestle with that irony until uh, of, uh, this family, this family had nothing but faith. And yet they seemed happy. While I had everything and that I needed materially, but I lacked faith. And inside I felt as empty and barren as their apartment. I walked over to the city desk to sign out a car and it was a slow news day, nothing of consequence going on. My boss could call me if something were to happen. So in the meantime, I decided I'm gonna drive over to the west side to Homer Street and see how the Delgados are doing. When Jenny opened the door, I couldn't believe my eyes. Tribune readers had responded to my article by showing the Galdos with a treasure trove of gifts, room fulls of furniture and appliances, rugs, a lavish Christmas tree with piled up wrap presents on underneath, carton upon carton bulgy with, with food, a dazzling se selection of clothing, including dozens of warm winter coats, scarves and gloves. On top of that, they donated thousands of dollars in cash. But I was surprised as I was by the outpouring. I was even more astonished by what my visit was interrupting. Perfecta and her granddaughters were getting ready to give away much of their newfound wealth. When I asked Perfecta why, she replied in her halting English, our neighbors are still in need. We cannot have plenty while they have nothing. And this is what Jesus would do. That blew me away. If I had been in their position at that time in my life, I would have been hoarding everything. And I asked Perfecta what she thought about the generosity of the people who had sent all these goodies. And again, her response amazed me. This is wonderful. This is very good, she said, gesturing towards the large, the largeness. We did nothing to deserve this. It's a gift from God. But she added, it is not his greatest gift. No, we celebrate tomorrow. That is Jesus. To her, the child in the manger was the undeserved gift that meant everything to her. More than material possessions, more than comfort, more than security. And at that moment, something inside of me wanted desperately to know this Jesus. Because in a sense, I saw him in Perfecta and in her granddaughters. They had peace despite their poverty. While I had anxiety and despite plenty, they knew the joy of generosity. Why, I only knew the loneliness of ambition. They looked heavenward for hope 
while I looked out for myself. They experienced the wonder of the spiritual while I was shackled to the shallowness of the material. And something made me long for what they had, or more accurately, for the one they knew. I was pondering this as I drove back toward the Tribune Tower a short time later. Suddenly, though my thoughts were interrupted by the crackle of the car's two-way radio, it was my boss sending me out on another assignment. And that sort of jarred me back to reality. And I let the emotion I was feeling at the Delgado apartment dissipate. And that I figured at that time that was probably a good thing. I would caution myself whenever the Dalgos would come to mind from time to time, overwhelming the issue, suing issue of the years. I'm not the sort of person who's driven by feelings. As a journalist, I was far more interested in facts, evidence, data, concrete reality. Virgins don't get pregnant. There is no God who became a baby. And Christmas uh, by is more for more like an annual orgy, a consumption driven by greed of corporate America. Or so I thought. As a youngster, like countless other wide-eyed children. I listened with rapt fascination to the annual Bible story about Christmas. But as I matured, skepticism set in. I concluded that not only is Santa Claus merely a feel-good fable, but the entire Christmas tale was itself built on flimsy foundation and wishful thinking. <clears throat> Sure, believing in Jesus would provide solace to the sincere, but simple folks like the Degados, yes, it could spark feelings of hope and faith for people who prefer fantasy over reality. But as a law trained newspaper man, I dealt in the currency of facts, and I was convinced. They supported my atheism rather than Christianity. So all of that changed several years later, however, when I took a cue from one of the most famous Bible passages about Christmas. The story describes how an angel announced to a ragtag group of shepherds that a savior who is Messiah and master, had been born in David's town. Was this a hoax, a hallucination, or could all that they, all that, that pivoted this event on human history, what was it? The incarnation of the living God. The shepherds were determined to get to the bottom of the matter. Like first century investigative reporters being dispatched to the scene of an earth shattering story, they declared, quote, let us get over to Bethlehem as fast as we can and see for ourselves what God has revealed to us. And and they left running to check out the evidence for themselves. Essentially, that's what I did as a living, what I did for a living as a Tribune reporter. Investigate claims to see if they're true. 
separate rumors from reality, to determine facts from fiction. So prompted by my agnostic wife's conversion to Christianity, and still intrigued by memories of the De Delgados, I decided to get to the bottom of what I now consider to be the most crucial issue of history. Who was in the manger on that first Christmas morning? Even after two millennia, controversy continues to swirl around that issue. Scholarly debate is intensifying over who Jesus actually was, divine, human, or both. And as it said in a recent Tribute article, quote, Jesus had been portrayed in a burst of books as, among other things, a cynical philosopher, a Hippocratic prophet, a zealot, a rabbi, a Pharisee, a feminist, a radical Eglorian, a postmodern social critic, end quote. The case for Christmas seeks to get to the bottom of this and explain upon my original investigation into the roots of this cherished holiday. Can we really trust the biographies of Christ to tell us the true story of his birth, his life, his teaching, his miracles, death, and ultimate resurrection from the dead. Did the Christmas child actually grow up to fulfill the attributes of God? And the baby in Bethlehem, miraculously, did it match the prophetic fingerprint of the long-awaited Messiah? Then I will end it there because of time. And, but I wanted you to hear that story about the people who found, believed, and trusted the truth of Christ's coming and the person of Jesus and had faith in him above all other things. Despite their earthly circumstances, and situation they were in that sounded to me like the poorest people I ever heard about. But yet they had a strong faith in the Lord Jesus Christ that carried them through the furnace of affliction. And God took care of them and rewarded that faith. All oh, the story of Christ's coming Thank God that he came. He came for you and he came for me. He came to be our savior. He said, I will to the cross before the foundation of the world, Revelation 13, 8, the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. Oh, the amazing love of God that reaches past our faults and our sins our failures, and he finds us. And if we'll believe on him, he'll save our soul, but he'll give us a, a new nature, a new life, a new name, a new family, a new destination. Oh, in Christ. Oh, it's a, such a foolish thing to reject him. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. And today, atheism and all these other isms, like communism, denying God. But how foolish they are. What hope do they have? What hope do they have? How sad it is if you think this life is all that there is. And I pray that you will, well, as I said at the beginning of the broadcast, get the right perspective of the memory of, a, of Jesus' birth. 
Get the right perspective in your mind. Personalize Christ, the Lord Jesus, the Savior. Personalize him to your own life and your own heart. That's a wonderful thing to love him and have him love you back. And uh, see, you don't only have flesh and bone and blood. You have mind, will, and emotion. But when you get born again and saved, you get an entirely new nature, a spiritual man that can commune and know the Lord God in your heart. And I just picked up a book from Brother Logston on the prayer partner, the prayer closet, how a man's wife died of cancer, preacher's wife, left him so alone. And it caused him to shut himself up, to be alone in the prayer closet and commune with God. And every day to spend time alone with just him and God, crying out to God in that prayer closet. And God promised if you shut yourself up in a closet to be alone with God. God will make himself known unto you in a special way. And this preacher's life revolutionized and turned into a great intercession ministry uh, to teach others the vital importance of the prayer closet, praying alone with God. Some people never do that. They say they're little head nodding prayers and uh, little habits they form. But how many really said the Lord seek me and you shall find me when you search for me with all your heart. Oh, think of the shepherds that sought Jesus. Think of the wise men that sought Jesus. That was the greatest ambition they ever had. And those Passover lambs held in those shepherds' arms was fulfilled in that, in that cradle called a manger. Oh, bless God, he came. And I pray tonight that you would draw near to God. And he promised if you do, he'll draw near to you. We need to love one another. I've been made fun of recently for saying things like that, but we want nothing between us but Jesus. I believe that. I'm not just saying that. Oh, Lord, deliver us from self and sin and the world and the flesh and the devil. And Lord, may we just be filled with Jesus. I hope every day you tell God you love him, every day. I hope every day you ask him to fill you with Jesus and the Holy Spirit and to fill you with the love and knowledge of your heavenly father. I believe that's what God's ears are tuned in a special way to hear your prayer. May we pray. Lord, I don't know who might be listening right now but there's someone that needs a touch from you. They need a nearness to you they have not had. They need a revival in their soul and spirit. They need a spirit of experience. And come to know and love you like the Delgados did. Despite poverty and hardship that they could Fulfill, be fulfilled with joy and peace and faith in you. Thank you, dear Lord, that it's real. And dear Lord, you will prove yourself to us as you did to Brother Strobel. Lord, when he sought you, he found you. And now has become one of the strongest contenders for the faith that we have on earth. Lord, bless this Christmas. We don't know, could be our last. 
I know that's especially possible for me. But Lord, it may be for all of us, we don't know. We pray for America to repent before it's too late. We pray for enough people to get saved, to finish the bride of Christ, the church, and that you could call us home. Lord, bless your people that are faithful, especially the preachers, the men of God, are contending for the faith. We pray for those in Mayfield where we used to minister that's been devastated by this storm. We don't know how many friends and loved ones that we knew has, has, has perished. But God, we just pray for them. Thank you for sparing Brother Logston, Brother Newsom. I give you special thanks for that. Now help them as they minister to those who are left behind. And I pray, God, there be revival in those people's heart. Now turn to God with all their heart. Bless America. Bless Sister Levita Groves, Lord. Our heart goes out to her. Lord, be present with us tomorrow as we, uh, Lord, commit the body of Brother Gary back to the womb of the earth. And Lord, that you would comfort Levita that she would know that he's in heaven with you. So I'll pray for our people, Lord, Sister Logston, that suffering so, Lord, such agony, such pain. Oh, God, be with her, Lord. Please help her. Show her mercy. Give the doctors wisdom and give them something that they could help her, Lord and remove this terrible, terrible suffering that she's going through. And be with Brother Lawson, the expenses have bombarded him at this time. Help him, Lord, we pray, as you have in the past. Lord, his little flock, Lord, be with them. Bless our church, Lord, our services Sunday. Trust in you, Lord, for a place to meet and to worship you, Lord. We know that the church is not the building, but the people. Help us to keep our eyes on you at all times. In the blessed name and through the blood and for the glory of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her King. Let every heart prepare him room. And heaven and nature sing. And heaven and nature sing. And heaven and heaven and nature. Joy to the earth. Joy to the earth. The Savior reigns. Let men their songs employ. While fields and floods, rocks, hills, and plains repeat the sounding joy. Repeat the sounding joy. Repeat, repeat the sound.